Chapter 18 The dwarfs sift through the chilly leaves and limbs as they pass, the ice, ice turning to dew as it falls. They have reached Treetop Point, sanctuary of the old elves. Their tree houses built high and some built into the very mountain going straight through the level valley. Gypsies and fey dragons can be seen. The gypsies conversing with one another and the fey dragons patrolling. The large fey dragons look more like giant frilled beasts than proper dragons. Their rainbow feathers and scales from neck to feet. A gypsy sees the dwarves and most stop what they are talking about and notice as well. Excuse me, but are you dwarves? Kriv and certainly others and certain others nod and some let out an awkward cough. Before long they are greeted by an elf named Yenzamiriad. He is very old and his hair is on him like a mop. Ah, the dwarves have finally returned, I see. What brings you to Treetop Point? inquires Yenzamiriad. Kriev bows a bit and quickly walks toward the elf. The fey dragon is ever watchful as they move. Kriev holds out his war hammer and drops it, commanding his army to s and saying, Lay down your arms, men. The dwarves start to disarm one, one by one. The elf smiles upon them all. Warm greetings to you all from the elves of old. May I help you? He says humbly. Without a doubt, we have traveled from our deep place within the Jericho of Mervon and request that you aid us in fighting the orcs again. Though they are not large in number anymore, they pose a threat to the humans to the south in Elimbarat, says Kriev. The elf looks them over and says, Just like before, we will honor our friendship with the elves. We, we here cannot offer anything, but our agent in Escadia City can aid you. It is there that you will have true dragons at your disposal. Come with me, all of you, the elf says. They venture to a small wooden arch in, arch in a grove hidden by trees and foundation and fountains. The elf whispers, whisper, whispers to it, let the noon break free your bonds of free mortality. Awezwa Tegaya Jessapezumbria Avur and Wea drum, and the arch glows with a subtle green energy, energy that fills the sides of the outside and causes a portal to open within its bounds. Enter and you shall be transported to Escadia City, specifically the feral priest's hamlet outside the town there. I bid you all a gentle goodbye. When you reach the city, speak with Thuzegius. He is a world elf, but he has our interest in mind. Especially what little military interest we have now. Kriev and Yenzamiriad shake hands, and the dwarves slowly walk through the gate in a single file, each as wary as the other. There are 58 dwarves, and the arch is only large enough for one to pass through, as it is too narrow. So this takes a while at least. After about 15 minutes, the last one leaves the site of the magic door, and the green energy goes away. The arch returning to normal. The dwarves arrive in a room set forth for transport. Men are gathered and talking, men in green robes. Each one that came through was guided out of the room before next could come through. And they all wait outside, all except for Kriev, who has elected to stay and talk. I am Kriev, king of all dwarves. The elves have sent me here to ask the help of... of Thesegius, do you know where I may find him? The feral priest argues and one stumbles on his words a bit and says, Ascadia Tower, it is in the middle of the city. The password to see Thesegius is simply the word leaf. Kriev makes his way out of the door, slowly, his boar hammer banging against the floor. As he walks, he leaves and closes the door with it. He is met outside by his company and he says to them all, it is time, my brother. Soon I will name one of you as Dorgarund, General, though it is, will be some time. Just be patient. The dwarves look on with, an, with anticipation, then size one another up. Size one another up, and some just look on at Kriev. At the tower, the feral priests and a messenger crow to Thuzegius, and they have called an emergency meeting together. 
to speak of their possible new allies, the dwarves. The meeting is in an uproar. Mercenaries are stomping their feet together excited, excitedly, and the council members are all there at the table, waiting. Kriya orders his troops to wait outside of the tower as he goes in to meet with the elf. The guard sees Kriyev, and Kriyev immediately starts to speak the password, but is stopped by the guard. No need, sir. Hurry. You are wanted in the meeting at the high post, highest part of the tower. Kriyev enters the central tower on its bottom floor, which has books, tables, a rug from the entrance to, to stone steps, with a rug from somewhere above the steps coming down to fill each one. He makes his way to the second floor, and it is pretty bare, just as well going down into a pit, into a pit, a lone chair beside it made of wood. He goes to the other levels and finally reaches the top. When he does, all of the mercenaries in the room begin to cheer and clap, for dwarves are counted as the greatest warriors of all time, and until now only a legend. He places his warhammer, as heavy as it is, on leather bonding on his left side. Please, dwarf, have a seat, said Thuzedius, I will stand. Thank you, Elf. Are you Th Thuzedius? Kriev, in Kriev inquired sternly. The cheering is down to merely anxiety amongst the soldiers. Edgar has simply been staring seriously, if not jealously, at Kriev this whole time. Cayman rises from his chair and places his palm firmly on the table surface and says, This meeting has been called because the dwarves have returned. Kriev, do you wish to fight alongside our forces against the orcs of Soratopa? Kriev nods and utters, It would be a great honor to fight alongside humans again. It will be different this time, but honorable nonetheless. But what is Soratopa? Edgar then crosses his arms and tilts his head to his right and, and arrogantly says, Oh yes, you dwarfs have been living in a hole for a thousand years. I will tell you. The orcs and felgans have allied themselves with all but and have all but taken over the greatest empire in the south, known as Fendragle. They renamed it. Kriev squints his eyes angrily, then comes to and says, These felgans are fools. I knew Sora last I was on the surface world. She would not approve of her kind terrorizing the land. She was a king. And gentle woman. She was a kind and gentle woman <clears throat> whose good nature inspired loyalty and was only dwarfed by her compassion for even her enemies. It was the time when I knew your founder, King Escadia. Every soldier in the room, even Edgar, gives a chest salute. Cayman looks about and then nods at Kriev and says loudly, It is settled then? Will the dwarfs fight with us on that dire day? Edgar then says, I believe it is settled. Oh, there is just one more thing. We here in Escadia City were given dragons to fight with us by the elves. They are just as much a part of our army as I am. That will not be a problem, will it, dwarf? Kriev looks flustered and surprised. Dragon? I will not be fighting alongside any dragon. Edgar laughs and says, Is it true then? It is true then, the old legends. You dwarves despise dragons, don't you? Kriev angrily turns to him and walks toward him, exclaiming, If you lived with them, then you would too. Edgar draws his sword and prepares to fight Kriev, but Kriev raises his hand and causes the entire blade part of his sword to rapidly melt, bend and fold, steam coming from it. Before long, the entire blade, minus the hilt, is melted into a blunt hot bubble. Edgar looks down at this angrily and throws the hilt, hitting Kriev's dragon skin armor. Enough of this foolishness now, yells Cayman as he slides his chair toward the commotion. Edgar, I want you out of this room at once until you are summoned again. Do I make myself clear? Edgar angrily marches out of the room, rubbing his chest piece, and as he walks out saying, Crystal, he bangs out, he bangs one of the door borders as he leaves. The meeting continues on a bit longer, and Thuzedius fills Kriev in on what has been going on. By the way, Kriev, we know you have a large contingent of fellows with you, so we have given you our eastern and western towers. It should be plenty of room for your dwarves to make home away from home. Both have vaults full of gold and treasures. 
and it is all yours to split with your men as you see fit. We on, only ask that you sign a treaty with us, explains to Zedius. Kriev looks down on the table to see a piece of fancy paper and a pen. Take some time to read it over. It is not very long, just the basics of trust and understanding between our people. Know that I speak for humans here, not my elven kin. Korea says, I understand. He reads it over, noticing the golden stamp seal of approval on the bottom left paper and signs it, placing it gently back on the table. All right, then. Came and signed it. I have now. We just need one more. Send Edgar back in. Hopefully, his nerves have cooled by now. Two guards leave the room and a minute later return with Edgar at their side. The Zedia says, Will you sign the treaty with us, Edgar? It will make our alliance with the dwarves official. Edgar walks up and signs away on the line, saying, They may not like my dragons, but I suppose I can trust the dwarves. My men seem to enjoy their company and idolize them for their honor. So be it. I have signed it. The meeting is called to a finish. <coughs> Later that day, Korea returns to his dwarves, who are all standing about and sitting around, some banging their maces into the sand. We are now part of Escadia City. I signed a treaty with them. We need friends and allies. I did not what needed doing. I am sorry, brothers. The rabble looked unchanged for the most part, and they started to make themselves at home in each tower, exploring the riches inside kept hidden behind lock and key. They had the keys, so they were not stealing. The towers were just as extravagant, and the central tower of the of the council. The dwarves seeked out a new home and found it in Escadia City. A war is going to be waged, and the dwarves are needed for their superior fighting skills. Eventually, night comes, and the city is almost ever changing. Yet not. A bitter, a bit later that night, Mirasami and Renault are sitting at the inn outside of High Post. It is pretty empty at the moment. This is not a wild place of drunkards or rabble-rousers like the tavern in town. The bartender, an older man with a black, finely groomed mustache and bald head, says to the two sitting close by, Drinks up. <coughs> Renault gets up and picks them both up with one hand, spilling the mugs just a little. He sits them on the table and lets out a happy breath. Norman Gall is sitting in the tavern at this very moment, at the far end alone drinking some water and, and smoking. His hands clapped, clamped together and staring at the two as they go about the night. It has not gone unnoticed, however, and the two look at Norman ever so often. Renault looks up and utters, Wait a minute. He gets up and walks to Norman and says, You are Norman Gall, the famous witch hunter. It is a great honor to meet you. Norman looks ahead, then finally acknowledges his presence. Pleased to make your acquaintance as well. Norman says, then looks down again, taking a sip and smoking a puff. Renault waves to Mirasami, who looks shyly at the two, conversing. She gets up and slowly walks toward Norman and Renault. This is my wife, Mirasami. Norman puts down his cup and holds out his hand in a welcoming gesture. They shake hands and Norman creeps back in his chair a bit, tilting into its legs some. I know who you two are, Norman says, looking straight and smiling past their faces. Excuse me? Mirasami's composure begins to falter. You two are refugees, are you not? Norman says, wiping his mouth. The two look relieved and Mirasami says, yes, we came from Drell because of the orcs. Norman then says, well, if you need... Anything, anything at all, you two let me know, and I shall make it so. The two smile at him with appreciation and walk back to their table towards the corner where his shelf is, but well lit. enters the tavern with a traveling garb on goes through they both look at each other and smile with relief Lita saying my daughter how 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 I have missed you I see you have found a handsome husband also 
Mirasame quickly gets up out of her chair and hugs her mother, both Renault smiling a bit. Both her and Renault smiling a bit. And Norman even gives a subtle smile from across the way. Lita pulls out a chair and says, Why don't you two have a seat? We have much to discuss. The two look at each other for a moment then sit down where they were. I have not fully forgiven you, my daughter, but it all turned out to be a blessing in disguise. I only wish I could have done more. Mirasami frowns and says, I was only a child, you know. Lita puts her hand on her shoulder and says, Yes, yes, I know. Lita sinks down a bit and asks, So where do you live now? Mirasami says, We lived in Drell and were happily married there, living a good life. I suppose we plan to buy land here outside of High Post. We have been saving up for a long time. Lita smiles and says, Well, if you ever need me, I will be in Escadia, just northwest of here, on the road in central Elo. I love you, my dear. It was nice to meet you, Renault. Please take care of my daughter. Renault cups his hand to his sheath and sternly replies, You have my word on that. I would do anything for your daughter. Lita smiles yet again and says, I am glad you found happiness, Mirasami. The tides of war are growing in the south. Friends are being made in Escadia. Refugees are finding safety in new places. And there are rumors of bad things happening in the desert kingdom of Belangu, a very old and bitter enemy.